whole people in prayer. Today, we're going to continue on our series on perseverance. Uh, and uh, this whole series is on spiritual formation. Mm-hmm. And we are trying to understand why our personal relationship with Jesus is so important and how that changes our life. Okay, uh, just hold on. So let's commit this time to God in prayer before we hear the preaching of the word. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your goodness. We want to thank you for your presence in this place. Yes, Lord, we acknowledge there's no higher name, there's no greater name than the name of Jesus. And we pray that we would, our eyes will be open to know your glory, your power, and your goodness in our life. We thank you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the previous time I spoke on this subject, uh, I just left you all with these thoughts, uh, how we can understand perseverance the wrong way and what is the right way to understand uh, scriptural, biblical perseverance. So the whole action of perseverance is not all about us uh, finding our own willpower and strength, um, believing that the faith of everything rests on us or I'm responsible for everything. It's like the picture, it's not like us taking the heavy load on our backs. And people can do that. We have seen many people persevere through huge challenges and and achieved a lot of things in life. But the Christian understanding of perseverance is far from that. It's, It's very different. It's about recognizing God's work in your life. It's about God and His will. It's about faith that everything is in God's hands. It's taking hold of His promises and finding rest in Jesus Christ. So if we have a wrong understanding of perseverance, we can, uh, you know, we can uh, burn out, okay? Um, Ministry can break you. Uh, The challenges that you face in life and so forth can make you depressed, turn you away from God, uh, take away that fire, that commitment towards God, okay? And so we want to make sure that we don't, push ourselves the wrong way. We don't try to take on the things that God has put in our hearts without Him, without knowing that He is at our side, that He is within us, that He is able to strengthen us. So it has to be a Christ-centered perseverance, and that's what uh, spiritual formation is all about. It's about Him. It's about having Christ helping us in this journey. So the other aspect of Uh, perseverance is to see that life that Christ has given us. Now, all these are verses of promise of what this life leads to, Uh, the final picture, okay? And in James chapter 1, 12, it says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, the person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35, 36, it says, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. And finally, in Matthew 10, 22, Jesus Himself, warning his, his disciples of the challenges that they will face, says, You will be hated by everyone because of Me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Okay? And now, when we read this kind of text about the promise of eternal life, uh, we should read it in context of Scripture. Now, uh, we should not get the a wrong idea of, of a carrot stick here of going to heaven, okay? So the whole point is not to beat yourself down so you have an access to heaven. Now, the point Jesus is saying is, if you follow me and if you stay with me, you will be with me. So if you read all these promises in its context, you know, and all the arguments and all the points that each of these books and every apostle brings, it points at Jesus Christ. So it's easy. Uh, you find that in the time where prosperity gospel was uh, really big, in fact, it still is, um, there's a lot of encouragement people to pray and say you pray to get what you want. So that was the whole point, how to find the right formula of prayer so that we can get what we want, okay? And then eventually people realize that there's problems with that. So they would say this phrase, uh, seek the giver, not the gift, okay? But somehow this phrase has become a 
cliche, all right? People say it without really thinking about what it means to seek Christ and, and not the gift, okay? Not what you can get out of Christ. And if you look at the whole journey of perseverance, you find that people who persevere have fallen in love with Jesus. They are very clear about their determination to follow Christ. And that's how it is. Like Jesus says, you come and, and, you're, and you see Him and you, He's full of grace and truth and you keep following Him. And then in that journey, you may face different challenges and God may ask you to die to yourself and pick up the cross. But because you see Jesus and that life lived you know, beneath the shadow of the cross is so rich and meaningful and beautiful, you continue to follow Him. So the whole point of perseverance here is Jesus, okay? And if we are not spending time with Jesus, if we are not growing in our knowledge with Christ, then it beats the whole idea of perseverance, okay? It can be focused on something else, something entirely different. And you find this is what the Scripture continually says to us. And this is something that we must think about very carefully, you know, how is our relationship with Jesus? So you find the whole uh, strategy of the enemy is to distract you, to make you think about something else, and all your battles of for perseverance is for something else other than being with Jesus, okay? Uh, he wants to disconnect you from the source of hope, of life, uh, of eternity, of goodness, so you can see that you are working you know, hard for your work, for your, your careers, for your families, and this and that and everything. And all these things are saying, I have to persevere and, 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 and pull this all together. But in all those attempts, uh, our, we shift our focus away from Christ into trying to find solutions for the many problems that we face each day in life. Okay? And, and then we find ourselves uh, having a very different perspective of perseverance as compared to what the Bible is telling us. Okay, so that is a key idea. So one of the important verses and, and, and uh, chapters that we have done, even during the church camp, was Psalm chapter 1. And this is a key verse uh, for spiritual formation. It speaks about what transforms us. So in Psalm chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, um, the psalmist says, you know, he, he is comparing uh, who is the blessed person. So the blessed person is not the one who indulge and, and sit with wicked people, but rather, as verse 2 says, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. The person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, okay? So, of course, I put uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, uh, when Joshua was about to take Moses' place as the leader and uh, take the promised land, uh, you know, being a young leader and afraid, this is God's word to him. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Okay? And then God promises that I will be with you. Now, my point here, the point of scriptures is this. You find that what it tells us clearly is the person who takes time to meditate on the Word of God develops the quality of being, uh, um, you know, fruitful and, and able to live in difficult circumstances and thrive and grow amidst challenges. Okay. So the quality to persevere, okay, in fact, more than persevere, to thrive, comes from the person who reads Scripture and meditates on it, okay? So we have to keep in mind, all right? I mean, many of us think about perseverance when we hit a wall, when we hit a difficult place, when we are faced with challenges. But here, God says is that quality actually comes into your life when you sit at the feet of God, listening and reading and meditating His Word. Okay? And I have to tell you this. Every person who develops you know, a Bible reading habit that is meaningful and thoughtful 
and spends time looking at scriptures, you know, and overcomes all the challenges that we face, the distractions and so forth. But every time they move into that place, you know, and they start working through those things, they all tell me the same thing, you know, that they find that they can draw from God's grace and strength in a meaningful way. Okay. So this is the thing. If we are not getting charged, or we're not getting empowered by God's presence, if you're not receiving from God, then everything else is difficult, all right? It's very hard to persevere on an empty tank, okay? It's very hard to fight, you know, when you are totally weak and tired. It's very hard to believe when you actually don't know what to believe and all your pro the promises that God has given you is kind of muddled and distant in your mind, okay? And what's clear here is, you know, one important aspect of spiritual formation. The power and the presence of God is transferred to our lives through His Word. Okay. And if we want to grow in intimacy, we want to grow in the graces and the power of God, it is through His Word. There is no other way. And the scripture says this again and again. If you want to understand God, you want to know Him, you want a Christ-centered life, you must be a person that reads the Word. And through the Word, you develop eternal quality and enduring quality. Okay? And, and Jesus says this again to His uh, disciples. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and put them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did, it did not fall, because it had its foundations on the rock. So the person who not only hears, but does the work of God, he has that enduring quality to withstand the storms of life, of judgment, of everything. Okay, And we know God is constantly at work, you know. And if you build your house on shifting sands, you know, the work of God will kind of break down your foundations and you will collapse. The changes and the things of the world will affect you deeply and you will collapse, you know, and give in into all the tides and the changes that is happening around you. And you, you know that. We know that. We can understand these forces. Either it's subtle, it's peer pressure, it's what we read, it's what we see daily, what our the people around us pursue, all this, you know, can move shifting sands, okay? But those who stand uh, in, on the promises, on the truth of God, who knows God's Word and do it, and that's how they make their stand, will stay put, will stay clear, will stay focused, you know, and will stay forever in the presence of God. So this is clear. Now, we all like a rags to riches story about how a person you know, from a very difficult background works and comes into prominence and riches and fame and, and, or achieves something. And that's fine. But we have to be mindful that this is not that. This is not about your great day, the big day that comes when you have achieved your mountaintop experience. This is not about that. This speaks after the great day when you have met Jesus Christ. And now, you know, it's about building your life on Him. Okay, so this quality is totally different. And, and the reason why Jesus was saying this is because He understood the superficiality of religion during His time. Many hearers, very little doers, okay? Many people can talk and say and speak of what religion is all about, of God, of the temple, of the law, and so forth. But no one has obeyed it in a way to understand the heart of God. And because they were so superficial during the time, they were angry with Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. They were constantly angry with Jesus because He was stealing the limelight from them. Okay. And they had a different rags to riches story as compared to Jesus who had a heart, you know, for God and had a heart for the Father. And you find that Jesus is very consistent in that idea. When, when He says, when He does things, He repeats again and again that what He sees His Father say and do, He does. Okay? And here, 
is an enduring life that never fades, that even till today brings joy and hope and salvation to all mankind. So church, this is what we have to think about. You know, don't wait till you hit a problem. Don't think about the challenges, but really think about what are the spiritual habits that you have developed in your life to strengthen you. Are you listening to what God is saying? Is your focus point, Jesus, is this whole journey of perseverance about discipleship or something else? Is it about you, your ambition? Because you know God can uh, sometimes agree with your ambition, sometimes not, okay? You know that you have dreams and desires, and some of it God may agree, and some God may not, okay? But there's one thing that is asked of us, and one thing that we should, res- or one person we should respond to, and that would be Jesus Christ, okay? So there is no room for superficiality. And if our beliefs and pursuits are not the kind that digs and builds itself on solid ground, then it will fall. It will be superficial. You know? and, and, and there are so many examples in the Scripture concerning this. This is... Uh So first, we must acknowledge that there is power in the Word of God. Uh, The reason why we read and uh, the the reason why we obey because God created the whole universe by His Word. Okay, And the Scripture says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And then Jesus says, You know, uh, the eternal quality of the Word, that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In Isaiah 55, verses 11, it speaks about how God talks to a a, a nation that is going through a very difficult season, you know, they are being, uh, you know, in in a place of exile, in challenges, and so forth. And God says that even though all this is happening, my word will not come back empty. So if my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And then Jesus says, the spirit gives life, the flesh count for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Okay. And then there are many more promises in Psalm 119, 50, this is my comfort in my affliction that your word has revived me. As the need for guidance in Psalm 119, verse 105 says, your word is a lamb for my feet and a light on my path. As for warfare, you know, Galatians chapter 6, verse 17 said, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, and there's a whole list here. So, church, my point is, Somewhere down the line, you know, in your spiritual belief, you need to ask yourself these very important questions. Are you reading the Bible? Are you growing, you know, in the discipline, in your ability to read and meditate on the Word of God? Okay. All right. Uh, And that is something that God just stirs in the heart of every person. Uh, Even for me, uh, sermon preparation does not count. Okay, God says you have to read your Bible and come before Him. You know, reading for knowledge does not count, but just the whole discipline of just coming in the morning, setting time, being focused, putting your gadgets, your phones aside, and reading the Word of God to hear and allow His Word to shape your life, empower your life, is important. And that makes your heart, you know, gives you the quality to be enduring and strong and clear. You have guidance, you have acceptance, you know, you have the promises of God, you see the goodness of God, and there is spiritual revelation, there is clarity, there is favor, okay? There's all these things in the Word of God. 
And you find in, in those days, um, you know, before all the smartphones, you, people actually just write down verses, stick it in their front of their office or put it around their house. And, and, this, and, and I, I used to do that. I, 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 every morning when I read the Bible, I'll just take down one verse that spoke to me and I'll write it down and put it in my pocket. Then when I'm in a bus, I'll just take it out and read it and just keep thinking about it. And, and, and that was my preparation for full-time ministry. Okay, um, you know, that was what God used to sustain me and speak to me and reveal to me the things of God. And, and I've picked this habit up from the many saints who have gone before me and, and many godly men and women who pay so much attention to the Word of God. All right? Our world may say we are very easily distracted. We don't have the time. We don't have, uh, you know... Uh, the focus or whatever it is. But if you do believe in all those excuses, then you are believing ideas that are contradictory to what God says to us. When God gives a command, it is not a command that is impossible to follow. But rather, if we talk about persevering, then it should start in this place. We persevere in our focus and our attention before the Lord who loves us. And then the other aspects of perseverance will definitely work out when this is clear. Okay, so think about this, all right? So what's interesting is when you have the word, you know, you have this Christ-centered life, you know, a firm foundation, a settled heart, a discerning and, uh, a person with character, uh, tenacity and commitment, okay? And these are the ideas. And it's very amazing when you read uh, autobiographies and stories of people and even many men and women of, 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 of ministry uh, who are, you know, in the church uh, have said this and have shared this story. So most of the story goes like this. Um, so the person has... has, has uh, God has put something in the person's heart and that person is doing it. And then after doing it, the person is facing so many challenges. So the person will come and tell me, um, okay, this is getting really hard. I will do this one more year and then see lah, I know whether I'll continue. Or they... You know, we get, or some of them will talk and I have to keep talking to them because they tend to get cynical because of the challenges. They say, oh, no one cares, nothing is real, nothing is good and so forth. All right. And then somewhere down the line, the person just goes back to God and reads the Bible and meditates and prays and calls on God and says, please help me, you know, sustain me today. And the next day, sustain me this day. And they learn and they grow and they grow. And then within a year or two, the whole perspective of their ministry, their life of challenges shifts. They see, they dream dreams, they believe in God's calling, they're able to see God work in the difficulties and challenges, they care for people, the cynicism dies. Okay. And they grow. So somewhere in the line of persevering in the presence of God, everything changes. All right? And that's what you must be mindful. If you don't read the Word, you'll be seeing the world in the same lenses again and again. And if that doesn't change, then what you believe and what you see, I mean, is, is going to be true to you. You're not going to go anywhere. But all these people... Suddenly, they are settled, okay? And, and it was interesting, the last person I spoke to uh, told me this word. You know, she said, you know, I'm at home with God. Okay? And exactly, that's what Jesus portrays, you know, in his relationship with God. He is in the arms of his Father. He's at home, you know, with God the Father. He's at ease. He had peace. All right. And that is what makes us strong. All right. 
if you want to think about how this, uh, why this is so important, just think about all the, the, the generation without a father and a mother. Okay, think of how brittle they are and how small things can kind of hurt them and damage them so much. They don't have the enduring quality simply because, you know, they have not received the love and encouragement and nurturing that one needs. And you find that God does that for us through His Word. Okay? So it's very clear that it's in His love, in His grace, in His goodness revealed through His Word, we develop that enduring quality. We grow and we become like our Father in heaven. So this is something that we should focus on. So the second aspect of spiritual formation is prayer. And this is so important, okay? And... I will read the sermon text. You know, this is a well-known parable. Uh, that Jesus speaks about prayer. Okay, so it's taken from Luke chapter eighteen, verses one till eight. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, "In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought." Okay, you know, very interesting combination. I don't care about God. I don't care about even what people say. I'll just do what I want, okay? And there was a widow in the town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I do not fear God or care what people think, uh, okay, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judges say. And will not God bring about justice for His chosen ones who cry out to Him day and night? Will He keep putting them off? I tell you, He will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on earth? Okay. Now you think about it, I think we all can agree, this is a pretty amazing parable that Jesus uses to teach us about prayer. Okay, a a horrible judge, a woman that just keeps praying, and then Jesus says, you know, uh, okay, this is what we should pray. So he first says that we should always pray and not give up. Okay, and that's the thing. It makes perfect sense to all of us because we always feel like giving up. Okay. We always kind of think, you know, this is taking us nowhere or it's not really working or all kind of things. And even though it works, it's just we don't have time. And then he, he, he portrays this person, a widow who kept coming to this useless judge, you know, with her plea, Okay. All right, and because she kept bothering him, you know, this terrible judge gives her just, uh, justice. And then he makes a cor- comparison. If this terrible judge can, can do this, you know, think about God. Okay? Think about what God will do. But the first thing about persistence and, you know, being focused here, Jesus say, is in the place of prayer. And then there's another... Uh, parable of uh, prayer, which the word shameless audacity is used, okay, both words together, all right? And this is taken from Luke chapter 11, verses 5 uh, to 10, okay, all right? So it says, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Okay? 
And then it's, Christ says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks the door will be opened. And then Jesus continues. Okay, he says, Which of you, of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So you find that there is different sections to this parable. It's, it's asking us to ask, to be sh you know, uh, shameless in our asking. And then it's this how much more, okay, which is an idea of... Uh, that we can see in the previous parable. You know, if this useless judge can give justice, how much more God can give? And God is saying, if an evil person can do good, imagine how much more a good God would do. And he's telling uh, about, about the normal dads who give food for their children and says, you who do those things actually are evil, okay? But you know how to do these things. So think about how good God is. So this whole how much more Parable, okay, the comparison, you know, okay, this judge, he did not fear God, he did not care about people, you know, he was bothered till he did it, and, 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 and the way she was bothering him, he was afraid, uh, she would attack him, or, and she was wearing him down, actually, and then he says, think about this good God, how much more he'll be willing to do it, okay, so this, this thing is not about wearing God down. Okay? It is not about uh, just praying, praying, praying until you get what you want. But rather what Jesus is doing when He says these parables, He's asking you, you know, when you pray, you first think about who you're praying to. You know? A good, loving, holy God who gave everything for your salvation. So, Persistent prayer, okay, if you keep praying and you keep reading the Word of God, you will actually develop a relationship with God. Now, it sounds very funny when I say this because it's kind of a very basic idea, yes or not? But that's it. And we, when we grow in these things, when we learn how to obey, when we learn how to trust, and even though the idea is basic, it's very rich. It's talking about a relationship with God. And when you have this, you'll definitely be comfortable in coming before God and asking Him and depending on Him. And when God is close to you, you, you know, and, you, and you know who He is, then the whole section about audacity comes into your life, you pray those prayers, you pray from your heart, you cry, you put your brokenness, everything before God, and you look to Him. There's nothing hidden in you. Okay? And, and there are other things that make us shameless and audacious before God. And, and this is, is, is how it is in the Bible. So you can see the first uh, well-known scripture, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, you know, he's shown a vision of God seated on his throne, you know, and he was convicted of his sin, and God cleansed his sin. And then God would say, who shall I send? Okay, and Isaiah knows the mess that God is referring to and the kind of person that needs to go and represent God and what that means. But the audacity here is to say to God, send me. I will go. Okay. The shameless audacity here is to volunteer oneself. <laughs> to represent God. Then you have people like Moses, again. And God had to teach him how to pray like this. God had to first confront him and say, okay, you go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And eventually, Moses knew how to pray in that vein. He understood that. 
And then he would pray, you know, when, when Israel built a calf and worshipped this idol and fell apart. And God said, you know, I'm, I will not follow these people. I'll just send an angel and give them what they want. But Moses would pray, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us from here. And if you read the entire prayer, you know, in that two chapters, it's amazing. He was totally audacious. He was telling God, you know, you, you blot my name out. Or, and, and, I mean, I, you know, don't let people make fun of your name because you are a good God. And he, he just was going before God with all his heart. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20, Paul says, pray for me that whenever I speak, Words may be given me that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And that's the thing. Paul is already in prison. He's already got a death sentence looming above him. But then he says, pray that I remain focused. And John would say, he must be greater, I must become less. Now that is... The kind of prayers. And this is what Jesus is shifting our hearts. Now, a very superficial sense of, uh, you know, spirituality would make it all about ourselves. And audacity would mean, God, buy me a BMW, a big house, you know, a nice vineyard in France, whatever it is, Okay. And that would, some people would say that would be, you know, shameless audacity before God. But as you read scriptures, people who know God and know how big His heart is and know how big His plan and vision for the world is, is people who pray this kind of prayers. And we pray for the nation. And we pray for unity. And we pray for healing and reconciliation among races, among people, among young and the old. And we pray for souls to be saved. And we pray life to be transformed. And we pray to live differently from a world that is driven by greed and power, you know, and by selfish ambition. And that's our shameless audacity, that this world is not good enough for us because we have tasted God. And that brings about a persevering quality. So, I would uh, I read this, this verse first, okay? Now, now the people who pray and, and read the word, they discover hope, okay? They discover love, they discover Christ. So in John chapter 15, verse 10 to 11, it says, If you keep my commands, you remain in my love. Just as I have kept the Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Okay? And Paul says, that is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know who I have believed and I'm convinced that He is able to guard what I have entrusted to Him until that day. So what's very amazing about Christ, uh, if, you, if you read John chapter 14, this whole conversation about Jesus preparing His disciples uh, for His departure. He's going to the Father. He's about to die and, and, and taken to heaven. Okay. And um, He was speaking about His intimacy with His Father and His relationship with God. And then the disciples will ask Him, how do we know where you are? How do we get to you? Okay. Uh, sorry, first Jesus would say to them this, okay? When I go, I'm going to prepare a home for you, okay? Uh, and then I'll come back and I'll get you and I'll take you with me. All right. So, if you want to wrap your idea of perseverance, you should wrap it around this promise of Christ. Okay? Then, uh, they ask him, how do we know how to get there? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then they ask him again, show us the Father. And then he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he speaks about the Holy Spirit, another comforter, another that will take my place, will remain with you. And then he tells them, if you hold on, if you keep my word, if you follow my commands, 
all of us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will make our home with you. So when you read the entire passage, a home that Christ prepares and a home in our heart. And this is the place we find the qualities to persevere, to grow, and to thrive in Christ. A home in the presence of God. And church, I would encourage you to read your Bibles and pray until you find this home, until you are at home with Him, until you know what it means to be a child of God, to dwell in His peace and His goodness. Let us pray. Just invite you to take some time to think about the Word of God. Think about your own prayer life, your own Bible reading. Think about the whole point of it, to know Jesus. To know the Father through Christ. To know the way home. To be filled in the Spirit through Jesus Christ. church, when we talk about perseverance, let's start in the right place. Let the Holy Spirit develop within us that habits and understand the depth and the riches of the spiritual disciplines where we are formed, where we are shaped in the image of Christ by the goodness of God. Let us drink from life-giving water and truly understand the rule and the power of God in our life. Church, this is a message God has been speaking to us. We have heard this very clearly in the church camp and God continues to assure us of this. And we cannot do anything because He's the vine, we are the branches. Without Him, nothing can be done. So church, I would just want you to just spend a bit time, a moment just thinking about your commitment in the presence of God to seek Him, to know Him through His Word.